Vilfredo Pareto was an influential Italian economist and sociologist in the late 1800s, often cited along with Max Weber and Emil Durkheim as one of the founders of sociology as a field. I've already made one video outlining a concept drawn from his Compendium of General Sociology, and I'll go ahead and add to that and explore Pareto's residues. Pareto defines a residue as a manifestation of sentiments and instincts. Residues can be derived from cultural history or from evolutionary conditioning. Pareto identifies six classes of residues, and I'm not sure that this list is exhaustive, but it will definitely be a good start for anyone looking to catalog the varieties of non-logical conduct in our species. Non-logical conduct does not imply illogical conduct. Class one, instinct for combinations. Generic combinations have two forms, one active and the other passive. The active form of combinations is often seen in magical ritual or primitive medicine, taking two substances, real or imaginary, and combining them to produce some expected result. The passive side of combinations is seeing one element of a traditionally paired unit and anticipating or expecting the other. One of the most prevalent forms of combination is combination of similars or opposites. An example of an active combination using generic likeness would be creating a facsimile of an individual and producing effects upon the facsimile that you desire to be seen in the individual. Combinations of generic oppositeness can be seen in many occult arts such as the Black Mass, where the rites of the Catholic Church are inverted to produce opposite effects. When we're dealing with unusual things or exceptional occurrences, people have the expectation that a rare event will be connected with another rare event, such as the appearance of a comet heralding the birth of a hero. When we're dealing with objects and occurrences inspiring awe or terror, we see the tendency to think that desperate times call for desperate measures. So when a village is in a drought and their harvest is in jeopardy, they are likely to commit some terrible act, such as human sacrifice, to correct for this terrible natural occurrence. Pertaining to combinations of similars and opposites, people have the tendency to associate felicitous states with good things and infelicitous states with bad things ubiquitously. For example, if democracy is considered to be a felicitous state, it is associated exclusively with good things. On the opposite side, National Socialism, or Nazism, is associated with an infelicitous state, and therefore everything associated with it is bad. And then there is the assimilation, the physical consumption of substances to get effects of associable and more rarely of opposite character. The homeopathic principle similia similibus carantur combines similars. The opposite principle contraria contraris combines opposites. One C, mysterious workings of certain things, mysterious effects of certain acts can be seen as a special case of the proceeding. Mysterious operations, occur in passive and active aspects. A saint's relic can be used in an active way to bring about some desired end by combining it with another object. And on the passive side, certain substances are believed to produce particular qualities by their presence. Mysterious linkings of names and things also has two aspects, passive and active. On the passive side, we hear the name Voldemort and expect some bad thing to result from it. On the active side, we have spells and incantations. 1D, humans feel the need to combine various residues, and that brings to mind the fact that watching this video more than once will facilitate comprehension because many of these residues rely upon another. They are organized by Pareto here from most ubiquitous but least potent to the most specific and potent. So combinations factor in just about everything we do, whereas the later residues I'll cover are more specialized. And then 1F, there is of course faith in the efficacy of combinations, not just in the particular ways we've just outlined, but in the general tendency to believe that A must necessarily be conjoined 
with B. To presume that concept A and concept B are intrinsically connected. Class 2. Group persistences, or persistence of aggregates. After combination has occurred, the new set of objects or concepts will tend to assume a character and personality of its own in the minds of those perceiving these things. Class 2a, persistence of relations between a person and other persons and places. This factors into sentiments relating to sociality, which is the fourth class of residues. 2a is relatively straightforward. We all sense the inherent relationship of family and kindred groups and the persistence of those groups. A people or a person will tend to be viewed as having an inherent connection, a persistent connection, with a particular place. And occupational status and social class is objectified and made into a concept with a personality of its own. Think of the plebs or the lumpen proletariat. To B, there is a tendency to view a persistent relationship between the living and the dead. To C, there is a perceived persistence of relations between a dead person and the things that belonged to him in life. It is my understanding that in certain Scandinavian communities, a dead person's goods would be preserved until that person's soul had transmigrated into a new body and could return to the site of their former grave and reclaim these goods. To D, there is a tendency to make abstractions into something inherently persistent, and this is, if you are a platonic realist, a logical and natural step. If you are a nominalist, then this is one of the fundamental errors of our thinking. I believe that Pareto was actually, in fact, a nominalist. 2E is related to 2D, the persistence of uniformities. When we perceive empirical reality, we abstract at a high level from that and then carry on this set of uniformities derived from the abstract and not the particulars that we're actually experiencing. This is, in a sense, the foundation of racism. We have the concept of a black person and then believe that black people come associated with all of those things that we associate with the abstract concept. Those uniformities are viewed as persistent. Sentiments are made persistent and mentally transformed into objective realities. 2G, personification, is straightforward. 2H may seem out of place in this class the need of new abstractions, but he refers here to the tendency for frames of thought systems of abstractions involving group persistences necessarily to become outmoded. And we need new abstractions to rejuvenate these mental frameworks so that we can forestall the collapse of these persistent aggregates. Class 3. We feel the need of expressing sentiments by external acts. Activity, self-expression. 3a. The need of doing something, expressing itself in combinations. So when we are haunted, by psychic phantoms. We may project this into the external world as a poltergeist and then solve the situation with a magical combination, applying holy water, uh, bringing in a religious expert, this sort of thing. And 3b, religious ecstasies can be seen in certain evangelical churches or the shakers. Class 4, residues connected with sociality. 4a, particular societies. This has to do with our need to associate into identifiable groups. The rest of these subdivisions have to do with behavior within groups. And the fact that we feel this need to identify with a particular society goes a long way in explaining the anomic condition in which we find ourselves. For B, need of uniformity. There is a herd instinct a natural voluntary conformity on the part of the individual, and there is uniformity enforced upon others. Norms are seen as sacred and violation is punished. There's also neophobia or the fear of new behaviors which break social uniformity. 4C, pity and cruelty. Self-pity extended to others, Pareto sees as a somewhat primitive form of compassion. Instinctive repugnance to suffering, he sees as being the product of weak people who abhor violence altogether, and reasoned repugnance to useless sufferings Pareto sees as the non-logical residue of the man of high quality.
4D, self-sacrifice for the good of others, risking one's life and risking one's property. We understand why evolutionarily we might have these instincts. In the past, the survival of one's children was more highly wrapped up in the future of one's local community. And it was also true that the local community more closely reflected your own genetic makeup. So sacrificing yourself was often the move that produced the best reproductive outcome in the long run. 4E, sentiments of social ranking or hierarchy. Pareto identifies the sentiments of superiors as ones of patronage and benevolence, sometimes supplemented by domineering and prideful sentiments. Sentiments of inferiors, he labels subordination, affection, reverence, and fear. And most of us feel a strong need for group approbation, or praise. 4F is asceticism, and Pareto has a lower opinion of asceticism than I do. I have my own explanation for that residue, and that is the fact of shamanism and the development of religions along the lines of the sacrifice of the mystic class, of the priest class, yielding a higher degree of conscious intentionality and control. So asceticism is a means of training the mind by reducing the impact of the animalistic will. Class 5 is the integrity of the individual and his appurtenances, or associated things. And Pareto's description here is rather interesting, so I will simply read that for 5a. Sentiments of resistance to alterations in the social equilibrium. The equilibrium may be one actually existing, or an ideal equilibrium desired by the individual. But whether real or imaginary, if it is altered, or thought of as altered, the individual suffers, even if he is not directly affected by the alteration, and sometimes, though rarely, even if he gains by it. If an existing state of social equilibrium is altered, forces tending to re-establish it come into play. Such forces are, in chief, sentiments that find their expression in residues of the variety we are here examining. On the passive side, they make us aware of the alteration in the equilibrium. On the active side, they prompt us to remove the causes of the alteration, and so develop into sentiments of the 5D variety. Moving on, 5B, sentiments of equality in inferiors. Again, I will briefly read Pareto's description. This sentiment is often a defense of integrity on the part of an individual belonging to a lower class and a means of lifting him up to a higher one. That takes place without any awareness on the part of the individual experiencing the sentiment of the difference between his real and his apparent purposes. He talks of the interest of his social class instead of his own personal interest, simply because that is a fashionable mode of expression. So by talking about the equality of your social class, the individual issuing the complaint is actually seeking their own aggrandizement. This is plainly obvious in the behavior of many social justice types. 5C, restoration of integrity by acts pertaining to the individual whose integrity has been impaired, and this can be a real individual or an imaginary one. Offenses committed against a real person can be extended to their deceased relatives, the honor of the family can be seen as disrupted, and combinations must be applied to rectify the situation. Or an imaginary individual can be harmed, a deity, and acts are required to restore the integrity of individuals associated with the cult of that imaginary figure. And 5D, restoration of integrity by acts pertaining to the offender, or vengeance, getting even. The offender can be real or imaginary. The god of a foreign people can offend the integrity of your community, or members of your community, or a real individual can be the offender. And likewise, particular acts will be required to restore integrity. Sometimes this means an eye for an eye, and sometimes this is sublimated in a legal framework calling for restitution of property, or even acts of contrition. And last, class six, the sex residue is the most potent of these, and goes beyond the obvious tendency to desire this sort of thing, but also the tendency to become overwhelmingly averse to it, carrying on a whole way of life oriented around sex by way of an aversion. As a disclaimer, I am working with Giulio Farina's abridgment with approval of Pareto 
of the Compendium of General Sociology, and there is much, much more that this abridgment has to say on these residues, but I think there's enough here to give at least a vague idea of what Pareto means when he talks of residues. Understanding residues is key to understanding element A of my first Pareto video, Influencing Non-Logical Conduct, which is sentiments. So, to understand the expression of sentiments, we have to understand the forms of these residues. If you think you have additional classes of residues, or some appurtenance to this line of reasoning, then please share it in the comments below. Thank you for listening.